Hello and welcome to the Gamer's Tavern. This week we're talking about the campaign setting Lankmar based on the novels and short stories written by Fritz Leiber. Before we get into the show, and while I've got campaign settings on my mind, I want to remind everyone that the accursed World of Morden Kickstarter is still going for just a little bit longer. You've got until January 26th to contribute to Ross's Kickstarter and help them knock out those last couple of stretch goals and bring more life to the dark world of Accursed. If you missed out on the first Kickstarter, you can also pick up the Accursed books in both print and digital copies as add-on rewards for the Kickstarter. You can go and find out more at accursedrpg.com. I also want to remind you that we have a Twitch channel. Every Monday, we play Borderlands 2 with in-character commentary with myself, Rots Watson, and Michael Sorbrook playing characters in the game. And every Friday, we've got Game Table Shadowrun Season 2 Plot Resistance run by Brandon Ginsimer. You can find the videos live and interact with us in the chat by going to twitch.tv slash Gamers Tavern Show, or you can watch the archives at youtube.com slash meet in a tavern. So keep a close eye out because we're going to have some big announcements coming soon as well. With that said, grab a drink from the bar and take a seat at the table in the corner as we're joined by Cubicle 7's T.S. Lukert to talk about Lankmar, the city of thieves. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Gamers Tavern Podcast. I'm your host, Ross Watson. And I'm Daryl Mott Jr. And tonight we have with us a special guest, Mr. T.S. Lukert. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show, T.S. Thank you. Yeah, well, tonight we're going to be talking about something cool. We're going to be talking about, as a game setting, a place called Lankamar, the City of Thieves. And seven co- score thousand smokes. Is that yeah, the end? Something like that, That's yeah. It's a great subtitle. <laughs> Now, we want to you know get into that, but before we do, we have some things we always do on the show here. And one of the first things we do is we ask our guests to tell our listeners a little bit about who they are and where they might know you from in the context of a gaming character sheet. So, Mr. Lukert, what is your gaming character sheet like? <laughs> Bard-like and multitasking. <laughs> it okay. has lots of points in different things. All right. Well, you're – Depending on the system in question. Well, you're, you're, you're not only a cowboy, you are a tech priest. Yes, indeed. And an apostate heretic, as a matter of fact. Okay, yeah. What is the finest? <laughs> so, and, uh, and apparently now uh, you are a scribe of Middle Earth. So. Yeah, indeed. And now I've become um, a lore master for Middle Earth. It's, it's a complicated run. I've right. been a freelancer for 20 plus years. So I guess if I was racking up skill in anything, it was probably in a – storytelling and world building. So you've been working as a freelancer for 20 plus years. That puts you back in 1995 getting started. That is correct. What did you work on in 1995? I was writing a bunch of uh, stuff that was just going up on the nascent web. Like the web didn't exist at all the way we think of it today. And I wrote a bunch of stuff that I was I was doing things for Feng Shui at one point there. I ended up doing a, uh, a whole bunch of uh, morphs for 7th C. And as I was kicking around through different projects and just like throwing stuff out, a bunch of D&D mods because we were on second edition, right? And it had been second edition forever at that point. So I was playing around with a lot of the stuff from – you guys remember the old green books? Yeah. Uh, Charlemagne's Paladins and the de- – yeah. Vikings. Right, yeah, yeah, and the old Vikings. Ooh, the great rune rules in that one, really good stuff. Oh, I love those rune rules, yeah. Yeah, um, the, actually there's really good stuff in, uh, in Yggdrasil. The, uh, the Viking game that we've got from Cubicle 7. But uh, at any rate, I was working on a bunch of miscellaneous stuff and just kind of throwing it out there. And uh, I ended up starting to work on various, I guess we'd call them indie projects now, but then there wasn't really that divide between indie and industry because it was so small, it was just all of us. <laughs> so I ended up doing uh, a couple different things. But the first one that really hit was I started working on a project that became Skull and Bones. Uh, which came out from Green Running. And uh, Skull and Bones was for, originally was actually made for 3.0, but because it took so long, we ended up shifting it to 3.5 when it came out. 
And it had a super long development time. And you'd think, oh, that was horrible. But actually, it ended up being distinctly to our advantage because it came out right around the time of one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and yeah, this it's, was a pirate's book, basically. Right. It's a pirate's book. It's about pirates and voodoo. It was actually based in part on Tim Powers on Stranger Tides was uh, one of our big inspirations. Well, if you guys know, the fourth of the Pirates movies was actually very loosely based on Stranger Tides. Oh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, on Stranger Tides. Well, as it was, I'm not surprised you did it. They ripped apart Tim's plot so bad that they literally had to put a thing on the movie that just says, vaguely inspired by, <laughs> <laughs> on Stranger Tides. So uh, because of that, I ended up meeting and becoming friends with uh, Chris Premis and Nicole Lindries and Hal Mangold of Green Ronin. And then came Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition. And that definitely uh, rechanged my trajectory. I ended up working with Chris in the core book. And the thing I did that to this day is probably one of the most famous projects that I've ever worked on. I was one of the lead designers for the Old World Bestiary for the 2nd Edition. Oh, that's a great book. Which, uh, thank you. It's consistently marked one of the best bestiaries ever written for a role-playing game. It constantly is at the right at the top three. So... Nice. I'm uh, proud of that one. <laughs> nice. That's that's for well as a guy who's done quite a few beast series myself. I think that's uh, that's excellent. Yeah. So after that, it just I did so many miscellaneous. You know, you know, you've been at it for a long time when you can't even spit out all the things you've done. They all just kind of blend together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your uh, highlight reel now. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, the next big one, and certainly one of the ones that I met Ross from, is I did Dark Heresy. I was one of the creators of the Calixis sector, along with. Uh, Mr. Premis and uh, Ben Counter of uh, Black Industry fame. We put together a bunch of the Calixis sector and a lot of other stuff that pieces of how Dark Heresy went together and it would work. And I worked in a couple of the different initial books from that line. So that was pretty cool too. And then I went on to, once again, obviously because I know Mr. Premis, I ended up being the one that he pulled in. Now, there was this fantasy property he had and it hadn't come out yet and nobody knew a lot about it. But he is like, I got to do this stuff and I have all these weird documents. Will you take a look at it? And I said, sure. And what he sent me were the proto documents of a little project called Dragon Age. Cool. And uh, I looked over all the rough documents and I ended up working on both of the first two box sets that made up uh, the three. That's the core of Dragon Age. And I wrote one of the adventures in Blood and Ferelden, which is like the big first adventure compilation for that one. So right. kind of bounced around to a lot of different stuff over the years here. And then all t- too many, like you said, highlight reels, Ross. Too many small projects in between that I don't <laughs> even remember. Now, did you, uh, were you lead designer on the Dragon Age stuff or was, who's that? Oh, yeah. I, I w- I'm not lead design. That's definitely Chris's baby from ground up. But I wrote a bunch of mechanics. My name's in the <laughs> – they just put out that gorgeous new core. So my name's in the credits in that one too. OK. Sweet. Yeah, this is what the age system now, right? AG. Mm-hmm. And they're using yep, this they've now, Yeah, they've now stripped up the system and it's what is going to be the core uh, at Gen Con here. They're going to have the one Will Wheaton's doing right now. Titan's Grave. Uh, yeah, Titan's Grave, the Ashes of Volcana is going to be a setting book for the age system. Right. As is Green Ronin's old Blue Rose is going to be an alternative setting book for that age system. Interesting. And, and that's just what they're doing for Gen Con this year. So that will be really cool. Now something that struck me about that first Dragon Age box set was it was, seemed like it was very much an attempt to make a beginner game that would then draw oh, yeah. in new people. Yeah, it would. It definitely was, and I, we're actually. I'm really interested in that. At Cubicle Seven, we actually have a new intro box set coming out at Gen Con. We're going to have uh, the Lone Wolf Adventure Game, uh, Joe Deaver's right. Lone Wolf. If you guys know, it was uh, the most popular of the Choose Your Own Adventure stuff. Right. We really built that ground up. <laughs> Poor John Hodgson has killed himself to do this. Um, it's really cool. It's built from the ground up to be a group of 10 to 11 year olds could be handed this box and all the adult gamers could walk away and the group should be able to figure out how to play it. Yeah. It, it literally has like video game style tutorials in it <laughs> for people that are truly completely new to gaming because like all respect to Pathfinder. But have you two ever looked at the intro box from Pathfinder? I, I like it. I, I thought it was pretty good actually. 
I for, think for trying to is... teach for trying to introduce new players to the 580 page tome that is Pathfinder Core Rulebooks, I think they did a good job on it. <laughs> exactly. But right now, the three of us are speaking from experience. Yes, they did a fantastic job of introducing a gamer to Pathfinder. I know what it looks like when you hand that box to young teenagers. They are horrified at the complexity and the amount of stuff in that box, and they are not interested. Well, we could we could actually talk uh, probably for a whole hour or two hours even about beginner games and you oh, know that's true. How, how they did or didn't do or whether they succeeded or didn't succeed. Like I've gone on record and said, you know, in the past, I think that Dragon Age, you know, was a really it was a neat system. It was a uh, it was a, it was a, a, an interesting approach to try and uh, get beginners in on it, but I think that unfortunately, what happened is it sacrificed too much of what Dragon Age was when that game came out, right? Because you get you go play Dragon Age Origins, right, mm-hmm. and then you pick up the first box set and you're like, cool, I want to play a, a Grey Warden. Oh wait, I can't do that. Yeah. Oh wait, <laughs> I want to. Oh, I want to play a dwarf from Orzammar. Uh, oh, I, I can't do that either. <laughs> so there's just an. Unfortunately, I think that's what happened with that first box. Set is it was a, it, it it sacrificed a lot of the license to make itself a beginner. Uh, oh, that's know, definitely approach. true. Though I, I would say, if you're now a Dragon Age fan and you wanted to get in, you pick up the gorgeous new core book from those sure, games, sure, no which doubt. I had nothing directly to do other sure. than some of my works in it, and because that's now like boom, Dragon Age all the way, and it's the whole. It's not just Ferelden, you know. It's right. it's all of all of that world. So, well, let's uh, right. yes. let's take a quick detour. I, I want to finish okay. off your character sheet with the um, the most recent events. You are now. What is your title at Cubicle 7? <laughs> my my nominal title is Retailer Support Manager slash Designer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which I've had weirder titles in Silicon Valley. but <laughs> so, we, um, Now, Cubicle 7 is a company that is well known for doing games like The One Ring, and they are yes. also the, uh, Doctor, the Doctor Who. Who. Yeah. The, the Laundry. Space. The Laundry. Yeah. Yep, The Laundry. Um, actually, the thing that we come in, have coming out at Gen Con, we had one for – to show off at Origins, and I've never seen, ever seen such lust in gamers' eyes. We have a line, the Cthulhu Britannica line. It's all award-winning stuff set in and around London, uh, well, England, written by natives. So uh, Cthulhu uh, Britannica Scotland won uh, any uh, two, three years ago here. Like uh, many of the, everything in that line is done really well. Well, we now have a super deluxe box set for 1920s London coming out. A green and unpleasant land. Yeah, that one. A green <laughs> and unpleasant land. So the 1920s London box set is when you guys see it, you're going to be amazed. When most right. gamers see it, they're just going to lose it. Well, it's got four maps that we license from the London archives. <laughs> they're nice. period maps and they're nice thick paper. There's three bo- – it's like an old school box set, guys. It's got three thick books, players, GM, and a adventure book it's got handouts for the adventures in the adventure book sounds it like a throwback a to the uh, max masks of an early orthotep type oh yeah thing. yeah it is sweet in fact uh mike mason and a couple of the a name you might recall that oh, yeah. and a couple oh, yeah. of guys from uh that are very well regarded from the cthulhu guys actually helped us write it and the campaign that goes with it the curse of nineveh and what what uh TS is referring to here mike mason was one of the three original designers on black uh black industries dark heresy game and Mike and I actually got a chance to sit down and talk a little bit uh, there at Games Workshop in Nottingham. What's funny about all this is that there is a really strong Cthulhu connection to Dark Heresy and all the 40K role-playing games, really. Because if you look at guys like Mike Mason, who are just not only you know 40K guys, but they're also Cthulhu guys. Uh, John French and Alan Bly are both big Cthulhu guys as oh, well yeah, as totally. 40K guys. So a lot of the original seminal guy, and you know, I'm also a Cthulhu fan too, right? But probably not to the same level as you guys are. So there's there's actually a pretty strong connection between uh, the Warhammer 40K role playing games and Cthulhu in some ways, which is 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 exciting. I like that. All right. Yeah. So let's wrap up your gaming character sheet with what is okay. the most recent thing that we should be on the lookout for from you. Oh, that's <laughs> that's like it literally came out in print like a week and a half ago. Ruins of the North for the uh, the One Ring line. Nice. It's the uh, one of. It's an adventure companion for the Rivendell source, which just took us – the the One Ring is set in Wilderland. And this actually just took us over the Misty Mountains back into Ariadora, Anor of old, where uh, the Dunedain 
still dwell in the shadows, uh, Aragorn's people. Nice. So all the adventures and ruins of the North, it's six adventures set in and around that. And I did two of them, including kind of the big wham, bam, final adventure called shadows over Tyr and Garthad. I mention this only because shadows over Tyr and Garthad sounds very Cthulhu esque. It does. <laughs> Even though that adventure really isn't, <laughs> it does have a title like that. What era do the adventures take place in? The one ring setting is normally starts five years after Bilbo returned to the Shire. Uh, so, it's- so there's a big long period there where interesting stuff is mentioned, but not a lot of things that people know. So it makes it a fantastic yeah. place to set role playing games. Well, I, I've worked on some Lord of the Rings stuff, uh, not in the role playing game side, but I did uh, you know some stuff for the the miniature game at Games Workshop, wrote some scenarios and whatnot. Oh, cool! And uh, got to work recently on the the uh, trading card game from Fantasy Flight. Got to write some stuff for. It was kind of bizarre because you're going to like the forge where uh, the guy made the rings, the elf guy. It's pretty. It's, sure. it's exciting. I, I don't remember the guy's name, unfortunately. But uh, Celebrimbor. <laughs> yes, uh, Celebrimbor. That's right, Celebrimbor and his forge was what I was writing about, which is kind of interesting stuff. That's cool. I, I know a lot of uh, One Ring players have told us that they use the beautiful illustrations that Fantasy Flight has in a lot of those pictures. Yeah. They'll pull those pictures and use them like, hey, yeah, yeah. you meet this thing. You know? <laughs> They'll hold up the picture and show them. All right. Well, let's let's talk about the next thing, which is what we've been playing lately. Yeah. So I'm going to start with Daryl. Daryl, what have you been playing lately? I have been, it's my first time playing this very interesting game that many of our audience will probably know. Uh, it's not really a game per se. Uh, it is Steam is having their summer sale and I only have so much money in my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, you poor, poor man. <laughs> between that and the humble bundles that have come out this week, I think I have bought 40 games in the last wow. week. Uh, but a lot of them were like pay five bucks and you get like this game and eight sequels and spinoffs and add-ons and DLC. So I'm getting, de- I'm getting a lot of good value for it. I think I've only spent like 70 bucks total on it all. So nice. and getting 30, 40 really good games, like uh, all the Hitman, the uh, left for dead. Uh, 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 I don't know if any of you guys have heard of this game called dark siders two. I managed to pick that one up. <laughs> so it, there's, I've just got like a, my, it went from 29 to 75 games on my Steam. Jesus. And there's still a week left in the damn cell. <laughs> so right. you want to – now, you know in the in the game industry that you can throw a stone and only go so far and hit people we know, right? Yeah. yeah. You know one of the writers on Darksiders 2 is Jason L. Blair? Mm-hmm. And you know who the other writer on Darksiders 2 is? Oh, who? Ross Watson. Ross Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that, yep. Ross. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's why I was saying it that way. Yeah. The, uh, so tell I us actually, about I Mr. Blair, heard... though. Let's, let's let T.S. finish his thought. Okay. Tell us about Mr. Blair. Oh, that, well, uh, so, you know, Jason, he's, uh, he's, done, he's the responsible for little fears, among many other really cool things. And uh, Jason these days works for Volition, and he was one of the re- lead writers for uh, – Saints Row 4, which if you guys never played it, is oh, it's, absolutely it's amazing. hysterical. The Volition makes good games. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, he's a he's an old table topper, too. There's just a lot of us around. Oh, man. Every time <laughs> I slip into odd places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Yeah, you really would. All right. So uh, please keep going, Daryl. What else have you been playing lately? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. I've also been doing a lot of uh, shopping for actual game products and a lot of reading, but I haven't had a chance to actually play much because uh, we, uh, between my uh, my mother had to go to the hospital, but she's okay now. Uh, she Thank needed God. to get checked out. Ooh. So everything's good. Uh, but we also sold our old house, so we're packing up stuff. So I'm finding a lot of old games too. And I have been looking for 20 years for my copies of Atmosphere and Battle Masters, and apparently they were hiding in the attic. Ooh, Battle Masters is it's that's a good old uh, Games Workshop. Combo. Yep, that's the Games uh, Workshop. Milton Bradley. Milton Bradley. Uh, yeah. it was uh, billed as a spinoff of like a war game style spinoff of Hero Quest. Yeah, yeah, totally. My, my copy is like friggin' mint too. The box is a little crushed, but it has every single component. Well, if you ever need money, to like you know. For an emergency, eBay that sucker. <laughs> yeah, you know what not, I have? They were going for like the last time I was looking for it. They were going for like three or four hundred. Now they're only going for like fifty, sixty, seventy. Well, yeah. you know what I have sitting on the shelf behind me here? Hmm. What? Chainsaw Warrior. Oh yeah. <laughs> With all the expansions from White Dwarf, so all the extra cards they did. 
I'm, nice. half, I'm half tempted to try to track down a working uh, VHS player that I actually hooked to a modern TV just so I can play Atmosphere once. <laughs> now, I, want, I want to be yelled at by the gatekeeper. <laughs> let's talk to Mr. Luker. What have you been playing lately? Well, let's see. You got to you gotta play with the gorilla once in a while. I'm actually running a 5e game for my, uh, for my, my two teenagers. So, yeah, uh, for those of you on the offshot chance that listen to this podcast that don't know 5e, that would be Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. So, <laughs> and it's fun. It is fun. They did a really good job. Merle's is an old buddy of mine, and they did a really good job with it. So I've been enjoying running that. We, um, we have talked about it extensively. About oh, you guys have? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we really big fans. Yep. Yeah, I they did they did an amazing job. They uh, the, I really think they defied the odds. I, I thought it was going to be a train wreck to tell you two <laughs> the truth. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a train wreck and they completely pulled it out. It's really fun. Though that's an example Ross of a concept we were talking about, adding on that second die. Yeah. That's the new thing they brought to the table. Yeah. <laughs> it's simple as that, but it's it works really talking well. Talking about advantage disadvantage, yeah. Yeah, advantage disadvantage mechanics. That simple, elegant Brought something new to D and D, which was very clever of them. Uh, the other things I've been playing, let's see, other role playing game. I'm getting prepped to run a Feng Shui two game when it comes out here at Gen Con. I mean, I've already been, I've read the PDF, but I'm getting ready to run the game for my whole family, including so you, two non gamers. So you know how to rearrange all the furniture in your house. Oh yeah, <laughs> for the maximum effectiveness. <laughs> but literally, the two of them uh, that are total, total non gamers, no RPGs, barely play video games, and my wife, who's flat out not, is gonna is willing to try Feng Shui too. I, I sucked them in with the gorgeous it. character sheets. Oh uh, well, I sucked them in with the gorgeous character sheets. That was the <laughs> that was the key. <laughs> I'm sad to say I'm sad to say I haven't played Feng Shui too. I, I have a huge, huge warm spot for Feng Shui one. Loved it. Loved it greatly, and I, I I'm sad that I haven't gotten Feng Shui Two yet to the table. So, without going too deep into it, I'll tell you the neatest thing that I think Robin did in this pass, and a lot of things have been updated and redone, so it's great. But one of the neatest things he did in this pass is changing up how the ammo roll uh, rolls work for guns, because I remember in the old days everybody barely ran out of ammo and hardly ever changed their guns. So when we run Feng Shui, you know, everybody would have their favorite guns and they just use them and nothing else because there was no mechanical incentive to do so. And this time he's done a really, really elegant set of stuff that it, it just follows the movie sensibility, right? Guns run out of, you know, the bigger the gun is, the more readily it runs out of ammo. Hmm. <laughs> the smaller it is, you can plink away forever. You know? and, and you still get a damage <laughs> bonus if you actually make the sound effect for loading the shotgun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that never went away. ka <laughs> That's a yep. great rule. I love that rule. Blam! And then uh, la- last but not least, not an RPG, but absolutely cool. At Origins, I picked up uh, Three Cheers for Master from Atlas. Hmm. Oh, that game is so much fun, you too. It's ridiculous. All right. <laughs> you are the, the four minions of a cruel and horrible overlord, and he's oh, sad. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. conquered everything, and he's sad. So you gather your minions into cheerleading towers <laughs> in, in the hopes of making Master feel better, right? Wow. But your minions are all horrible, murderous <laughs> So mm-hmm. they don't exactly all want to stand on each other's shoulders while you're trying to get them into cheerleading. It's hysterical. It's it's really fun. That's great. Well, I'm just going to really quick go through some of the stuff I've been playing lately. Uh, oh, cool. I've got a fifth edition Birthright game that I'm running. That's going. To oh, be wow. Birthright. We play about once a month and we've been going for about nine months now. So uh, we've gotten up to sixth level. We just hit sixth level and defeated kind of a major bad guy in the last uh, last game. And everybody's really enjoying themselves, having a fun time. We're. Uh, I think I'm encountering some of the uh, some of the cracks in Fifth Edition. I still think it's a really great edition of, of D and D, but uh, I've got at least one player who kind of obsesses over mechanics, and he's he's been coming to me a lot lately, saying, you know, I think you need to fix this. I think you need to fix that. And you know, he, he's probably right. But uh, at the end of the day, Fifth Edition is still a great game. And we've got our Shintar game, which we run here every so often. Uh, that's Savage Worlds High Fantasy, mm-hmm. uh, which is an awful lot of fun. But unfortunately, I haven't been able to do an awful lot more tabletop gaming because I've been really, really busy. I've been uh, you know, working on a lot of things. But I have had a chance to continue playing Valkyrie Chronicles, Valkyria Chronicles, I should say, on Steam. Mm, yep. And I just recently started uh, Grand Theft Auto V. 
Ah, yes. Yeah, GTA. Yeah, it's 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 a fun game. <laughs> I'm enjoying that greatly. So uh, that's what I've been playing lately. Let's talk about <clears throat> the next thing is we do a thing called Tavern Tales. And okay. in Tavern Tales, we ask our guests to give us a story of one memorable die roll. So T.S. Lukert, can you tell us about a memorable die roll? I had my most beloved character for Feng Shui was called Six Axes. And in the game, they said he was the perfect green monk. Now, if you guys remember the green monks, they were basically a group of the Shaolin hand, guiding hand guys that resisted all damage, all outside forces. And he became a dragon in part because he eventually resisted the indoctrinations of Quan, you know, Quan Lo and the, the guiding hand. So truly the perfect green monk, he even resisted the things he wasn't supposed to resist. So this character <laughs> had this ongoing thing with the set of duct taped boots that had literally walked through hell. <laughs> At one point, the underworld <laughs> couldn't even keep him down. And we had this one character, this big bad guy that we met time and time and time again, Axe Head Morin. And at the key moment, if you guys know the Feng Shui mechanics, if well, you roll two sixes at once, it's a positive and a negative die. And if you roll two sixes, then weird things happen when you find out after the first six roll, you roll them both again to see what happens. Right. So – it's a role that could go either way. It's, yeah, it's it, going to be awesome, but it's going to either be awesome, good, or awesome, bad. Yeah, things are going to go horribly, spectacularly wrong, or horrible, you know, or the other way around. And just in case it went really bad, I also added in a fortune die, which is an extra d6 that, in theory, doesn't explode. So I rolled three d6 on the first shot of. And my descriptor stunt was like I leap across the room and kick him in the face, like when he was in the midst of trying to get out his exposition. <laughs> It's like I'd leap across the room and kick him in the face. So I rolled three sixes. I rolled again two sixes on the devil's eye. And then I rolled again with a positive five and a negative one. Oh, oh, oh wow. So it's literally one of the highest I could have possibly rolled after nice. two double sixes. And everybody at the table mm-hmm. just like burst into cheers. And the GM was just like, you leap across the room and shatter all of his teeth and your boot gets <laughs> stuck in the back of his head <laughs> or hanging from his mouth. Wow. <laughs> he, was a, he was a titan. He was an ogre, you know, wow. like, literally, literally hanging from this guy's mouth. But he's just like, he's floored. You literally floored him in a single hit. <laughs> See, in Feng Shui, you know, the bad guy is, is, is serious business because he has a name. Exactly. The like, second he has a name, you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could describe the most awesome looking dude, but as long as he doesn't have a name. <laughs> he's just a cool looking move he's just a cool looking move all right well let's jump into our main topic tonight which is Lankamar. and we're talking about it as a setting not necessarily this is like a book club right oh yeah uh so we're going to talk about it primarily with its relation to gaming uh and game settings but let's start with the very very basics and i'm going to ask daryl daryl what is Lankamar at its most basic level at its most basic, it's a uh, setting based on the novels of Fritz Leiber. Like, did I get that right? Fritz. Fritz, Fritz Leiber. Leiber. Fritz yeah. Leiber. Um, and it is pretty, I, I don't want to say, the, com- the comparison that's always come to me has been Thieves World, but it's not quite that. It's a little bit m- more heroic than that. It's not quite as dark and gritty, but it's a lot more realistic in its depiction of a fantasy world, and I may be completely off on this, so please correct me if I'm wrong. This is just my impression of it. No, no, you're, you're, Fritz Lieber wrote a bunch of stories about these two guys named Fafford and the Grey Mouser. And these two protagonists were, uh, they adventured in a world that was called Nawan. The novels and stories about these guys came to be called the Lankamar uh, stories because most of them are set in a particular city called the city of Lankamar. Now, the tone and the feel of these stories, uh, this is where we get the term sword and sorcery. It comes from the Faffer and the Grey Mouser novels. So it is, you know, roguish adventure. It is, you know, guys that are spend, they spend time drinking, feasting, wenching, brawling, stealing, gambling, and they're seldom fussy about who hires them, (laughs) right? They they are heroes, right? They are humane and they do relish true adventure, uh, but they are not particularly epic heroes. They're not Aragorn or Gandalf, right? They are... They're Han Solo. Yeah, well... Kind probably. of. Probably. Yeah, yeah they're, they're kind of like that, yeah. 
well, so Fafford it, is a barbarian and the Grey Mouser is a thief and sorcerer. And these two guys basically team up to steal things, get rich, party like rock stars, and then do it all over again. Yeah, if I was to – the the clearest cut that I usually make with it, because especially when we try to compare things to it, it's the original. We actually should be comparing things to it, not trying to say what it's like, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you're it's, trying to explain yeah. it's like, uh, it's, it's what these things came from. And, and to, put is, this, to put this in perspective, these – Books were written and started. They started. Uh, ah, Lieber started writing these in the 30s. So yeah, 1939. Yeah. Though the publication dates were actually quite a bit later than when he started writing them. Yeah, the earliest mm-hmm. one I can find is uh, Jewels in the Forest, is the 1939. So. Yeah. Uh, they say a number of the things that he worked on over the years, some of them he tabled and got back to later on uh, several occasions. Yeah. Right, a lot of them kind of, and there was long periods of time too between the the early stuff that was like the 30s, and he was doing stuff all the way into like oh, he recompiled everything to the the books that most folks would know now, like in the later 60s. Right. I mean, there was just this huge long series of time as he thought about different stories with these two. If we think of D and D as being directly the child of the Lord of the Rings. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is the child of Fafford and the Grey Mouse. Right? Yeah. Well, the, and, and so this is where we get Lankamar as yeah. a setting is because most of their adventures, not all, but most of their adventures of Fafford and the Grey Mouse are, take place in this, this vast city called Lankamar. And it's a decadent Byzantine city full of all kinds of plots and schemes. And it's ruled by overlords who are very – self-centered or weak or distracted by their own little crazy plots and things like that. So it's, it's a, it's a very, it's a very good setting for roguish adventure. It wouldn't be right for Gandalf and Aragorn, but it would be totally a place where Conan could feel at home. Oh, absolutely. So just so, just so we're clear on the tone and feel of, of Lankmar. Now as a game setting, uh, of course, Lankmar has evolved over the years through a number of different ways. Daryl, why don't you tell us about a few of the ways that Lankmar has been a game setting? Well, it started off uh, actually before I think even the novels were written according to something I read on Wikipedia. And as we all know, everything on the internet's true. So <laughs> grain of salt here, but apparently uh, uh, Lieber and his college friend Harry Otto Fisher created a war game setting uh, in Lankmar in 1937. It was basically, it's called a war game, but I think it might have, it was around that time before war game was actually a hobby thing per se. Well, this is, this is way back in yeah. the, this is pre even like the chit and measuring tape crowd, right? Yeah, this is, this would have been more along the lines of war gaming was something that you did to actually train a tactical mind to lead troops kind of thing. Uh, would have evolved out of that, the actual um, games that they played in preparatory schools and military schools. Well, it all evolved out of a thing um, – in, in a way, the, the recreational version yeah. evolved out of H.G. Wells' Little Wars, which mm-hmm. was a series of rules for uh, playing you know, war games as a, a hobby or pastime. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first appearance of that actually actual game getting published was when it got modified when it was released by TSR as a board game board game slash war game in 1976 Woo-hoo. that was actually redesigned by gary gygax robert please tell me Kuntz. how to pronounce Kuntz. it's Kuntz. thank you yeah. i've never heard that name said aloud so <laughs> it's robert Kuntz. <laughs> and uh brad stock created that but it wasn't actually created as an actual campaign setting until the first edition in 1985 designed by bruce nesmith douglas niles and ken rolston yeah, it had some great artwork on that one. Keith Parkinson, Jeff Easley. And uh, that actually was a neat – I remember this setting. Uh, do you, did you have the setting box, T.S.? Oh, well, I certainly had the setting box, though, as you guys were talking about it. I actually think the first appearance, aren't we going to deities and demigods? The original New oh, Gods were all in deities and they were. demigods. That's a well, very they, good point. I, th- I think they were one of the ones that were excised whenever uh, no, for no, the third printing. No, they no, were no, the no, one no, no, That wasn't. That's because true. It was yeah. not. Okay. Labor was down with it, and he was like, "I wish you guys had asked me, but it's okay because he was down with gaming." Yeah. Mel Nimbinans, Moorcock was pissed as hell because they hadn't asked him, and actually mm-hmm. said if they bloody asked him, he would have let them, <laughs> but they didn't. And um, the Lovecraft estate is sued. Because Lovecraft said, no, 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 no. The estate said you had no right to have the Cthulhu Mythos. Well, they also, uh, Chaosium had purchased the rights. 
Anyway, suffice to say that he's, T.S. is right. The first appearance is probably deities and demigods in gaming. And this is – it kind of established the game setting sort of by implication yep. for that uh, because they didn't really talk about Lankamar that much. But they did talk about it enough to give you an idea of what that world was like. So, yeah, deities and demigods, that came out – let's see here – 1980, so it had been five years prior to the uh, box set. It's taunting me from my bookshelf. My hurt back won't let me pull it down. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, yeah, so we got 1980. We got the Deuce and guys. Then we have the b- first box set in 1985. Now, this was a big box set, and it was like one of the first times that um, this was looked at as just like a big city box. Yeah. This and was it, not may, – maybe not the very first time, but it was amongst the first times that yeah, – I think it's uh, – Predated the, I think the first one that was like that was the Waterdeep one, but this actually predates uh, Waterdeep in the North by well, a year. It, it has some interesting rules in it for social encounters, like haggling, bribery, uh, different social levels. Had a full color poster map. Yep. More than a hundred NPCs were in it. It was it was a big deal. And I seem to recall it being one of the first ones that really played with that social levels too, Ross. I, mm-hmm. That one I could be wrong on, but I remember it as having specific stats about the social levels you were in and your connected levels in it. So you had to be careful because like, oh, they're not even going to talk to you. You're scum from the streets. Yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> that actually reflects back to Lankamar as a setting because there are parts of Lankamar that are like the noble quarters, right? Yeah. Where, where there are guys walking around who could buy and sell you based on their inheritance and they don't want to give you the, the time of day if you're just some scruffy thief from you know down by the river or whatever. Right, and there's parts of the city where if any nobleman set foot in, they would probably never be seen again. <laughs> they would disappear. Yeah, they would just vanish, right? Because it's 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 not exactly lawless, but it's pretty close in lots of part in different parts of the city. Now uh, we had another box set that came out in ninety uh, three. It looks like ninety six, according to my research. It's, uh, it depends on which of the two. I've got one source that says ninety three, one source that says ninety six, and I haven't had time to actually try to find a copy right. online. Now this was an update in the original set, and this included some. Uh, this includes work from uh, Shane Hensley, who went on to do Deadlands and found Pinnacle Entertainment Group and Savage Worlds. Uh, this is when he got involved. Was in the ninety three ninety six set, and clearly has never stopped loving it. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, because you know, skipping ahead several decades, we have now <laughs> the, the newest thing is Savage Lankamar, mm-hmm. which just came out this year. Uh, so that is. That just came out this year. It's available for PDF now in pre-order for hard copies. I don't know right. when that's actually coming out. Uh, designed by Thomas Reed. And then we've got two former guests and friends of the show, Timothy Brian Brown and Daryl Hardy, who spells Daryl wrong. <laughs> oh, and there's, and there's this other guy. I'm not sure the pronunciation. This is Latson. Wet Sam. I also worked on it. I also worked on it. I got to write the uh, official Savage World stats for Faffer and the Grey Mouser, which oh sweet, yeah. And I did the uh, did all the NPCs and uh, basically jewels in the forest as an adventure, things like that. It was it was really cool. So so yeah, we we skipped a couple of things though. We skipped uh, Mongoose did a RuneQuest version. Oh, that was well skipped (laughs) in two thousand six. Apparently, I honestly don't know much. This is the one I know the least about. I've never seen it on anyone's shelf. I've never seen it in any game stores. I couldn't tell you anything about it besides the fact that it was published through Mongoose and it was a RuneQuest version. Can anybody help me out here? I would uh, suggest that you haven't seen it because the art was hideous. <laughs> well, don't, don't like, sugarcoat it. Tell like, us how you like, really feel. I, you know, I, seriously, I am, I am not by any stretch of the imagination out on a, on a limb on this one. It, okay. it is really not very good. Yeah, I'm looking that at was, the covers on Amazon right now. It's a RuneQuest colon Lankmar and the cover. It, it's not absolutely horrible. It's just, it, <laughs> It it looks like they could have put a little more effort into the, the cover image. Well, let, let's say let's put it this way: we've all seen we've all seen covers that we can talk about on the show that are disappointing in different. Oh, ways. that's true. Um, let's talk about. There's an exalted product that is basically camel toe mm-hmm. ah, all that. day, right? <laughs> there is a. There's also the cover of Rift's Black Market, which is all done in Poser 3D art. That's true. Yeah. I, I would. I guess I would only suggest, and I don't want to pile on them too much other than there is a definite difference between a cover in poor taste and a cover that's just not very well done. Okay. That's a good point because the artwork on the uh, 
the artwork on the Exalted one is actually great, great artwork. It's just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just well Campbell done. Tuck. It's just what it depicts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and to be fair, you know, on this show, we don't hate anything. It's all disappointment. You know, if we're disappointed in something, yeah, well, say that. It looks like I was going to stab at it because the inside is not bad. But I believe that's why you don't see it on the shelves because I have read that and it's not bad. But they used some of their uh, updated RuneQuest system for it. And it, it, it was not the worst interpretation of Wankmar, I think. Well, there's, but, a, there's, a, there's a review on Amazon that says, other than the art, A+. Plus. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, the writing was not bad. It was, it, it was an interpretation through the RuneQuest system, right? Their kind of slightly modified RuneQuest system. So if that's your thing, it certainly depicted the kind of bloodier end of Wankmar. Well, all right. So, so just to be clear, we've talked about a bunch of different. We've actually talked about it through three different game uh, systems. Yeah, we've talked about it from 1985 to 2015. So, 30 years. This project, this setting, has been in prints at various times as a game setting you can play in. I guess the next question I'm going to ask, and this I'm going to direct directly to TS because. Uh, one of the reasons why we brought you on the show to be a guest about Lankamar is because you're very knowledgeable about Lankamar, isn't that right? Oh, it is. Spent a lot of time there. <laughs> well, tell us what that means. Well, Lankmar, I it was funny when you were guys were talking about, well, what would you say about Lankmar? It's really urbane is the word you hear when you talk about Fritz Labor a lot, urbane and cynical. Hmm. Right? And these days cynicism is not in short supply. <laughs> but you know, when he was first writing some of that, cynicism was actually out of favor. Having heroes that weren't anything of the kind was kind of unusual. Right. You had guys that run around and did their thing, but he really, you know, he embraced these guys were out to drink and make money and do their thing. And when it became a game setting, you know, we, we have this long legacy in our role playing games with are you murder hobos? Right. Yeah. You, is that what you do? Yeah. And the thing is, if you read the original stuff, that isn't what Fafford and the Grey Mouser were. They saved people occasionally. They did the right thing occasionally. They weren't bad guys they just weren't great guys either <laughs> yeah. well the way i look at it and, and you can correct me if i'm wrong on this ts but the way i look at lankamar and the thing i love about lankamar as a setting to me it's the well it's the grand theft auto of gaming settings <laughs> it's it's yeah. the setting where if you want to go beat up a pimp you can go beat up a pimp if you want to steal like something because you feel like stealing something that's perfectly in keeping with the tone you know you you murder some guy that looked at you funny across the bar so be it it it's got that and it also has that uh that sense of adventure that like i found a map right and this map might actually lead us something i've heard rumors of this dark cabal that goes on that apparently they use gold swords when they do their sacrifices so if we get in early we can steal the swords <laughs> yes <and> save <laughs> the sacrifice you know I, well, if, if, she's, if she's issue. worth saving, I mean. Yeah, exactly. The, the <laughs> sacrifice is a second issue. We just want to get the play. So is there a reward for bringing you back? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. that's a question that is perfectly in keeping with Faffer and the Great Master. They, would they leave her there to be sacrificed? No. They yeah. would absolutely take her. But they would look into that whole reward thing for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is, is she and, – and if she came from a poor family, she'd show up. You know, if they wouldn't have molested her or doing anything, they, they were above that sort of thing. She would have showed up unharmed. But if she was a noble, well, you know, <laughs> there's a little bit more money to get out of that. So. Well, it, it, let's just say that there are some – there's some moments in the books where the characters of Afro and the Grey Master can act a little – they can, they act unheroic to the point where I feel a little creeped out. Let's put it that way. Well, yeah, I, I, would, I, will, I wouldn't put past the Grey Mouser, for example, to return the to return the sacrifice, you know, completely untouched. Let's just put it that way. Um, but that's well, those books are written in a you know. Let's, they, well, suffice to say, I, I'm judging these books with a you know particular mindset. So, um, the, well, I will. I know as well, I know, heroes, like yes, yeah, I, I know where you speak, and I will just observe something that a lot of people don't know. Uh, one of the most dodgy stories in that it definitely implies that maybe Mouser is engaging in rape. Yes, it's not actually written by Fritz. That was actually written by Harry Fisher. Ah, and because he was his friend and whatnot, he included that into the overall story. But later on, Fritz said that was not what he would have done on his own. Later uh, on, well, okay, that, so there you go. 
because there's one famously we we won't go further than that, Ross. But there is one famously like whoa, because if you like a great yeah. master, you're like, this is kind of out of character. It what is. is going on? Yeah, let's just and, say euphemistically he seduces her in yeah, a questionable then, manner and move on. Right. And the thing is, I'd always loved those books, and I too that sh- stuck out so glaringly for me. Yeah. I was like, what the? And then when I found out later on, Fritz didn't write that. I was like, ah. Okay, so in, in the stories like, written by Lieber, then then yeah. that, then we can say that for sure that that is something. Yeah. Okay. And that's and it really, but you're right. That comes out for sure. And especially if you're like have read them all, it, there's one or two glaring things that you're like, "Whoa, what about that?" Well, guess what? That was because it wasn't Fritz. Okay. So at any rate, they're definitely. I, I wouldn't call them saints by any stretch of the imagination. No. And stories set in Lankmar definitely take that into account. You're dealing with a, a city where I'll chew you up and spit you out if you're not hard too. Well, let me ask you this question. What would you say makes Lankamar unique as a game setting versus, say, Waterdeep or Freeport? First off, especially in fantasy worlds, Lankmar only pays lip service to gods. It doesn't give them any respect whatsoever. Wait, There's what, the what one... about the gods of Lankmar? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The gods of Lankmar are not the same as the gods worshipped in Lankmar, are they? <laughs> yeah, but I would, I would argue that there is some respect given to the gods of Lankmar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that don't know what we're speaking about, um, there's basically the the mummified lords that made Lankmar what it is when somebody really has a chance of assaulting the city. When various forces turn against the city that could really help them, the mummified lords of Lankmar rise from their tombs and just pound the crap out of whatever's disturbing them well, in their city. They, they, yeah, they, the, the the risen lords of Waterdeep, the gods of Waterdeep, uh, these mummified creatures, they are – well, they're pretty much death on two legs for anything that's attacking the city. But at the same time, they will then punish the people of Lankamar. For waking them up in the first place. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a like damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. But, but so they've got uh, – thinking in terms of like what makes it so unique. So you've got like the city – You've got the one street of uh, the series of streets, the one neighborhood, like the I think it's like the street of ten thousand gods. Yeah, the street, the god, yeah, so, street of gods. Yeah, yeah, it's like, and it's literally like everybody moves up and down the street depending on how many worshippers they have. It's like utterly ruthlessly practical, right? Oh, you're a big god. You're at the front of the street in the huge temples. Oh, you're just a little god worshipped by a few. Oh, you probably got a now these are arch on the end of the. These are what's called the gods in Lankamar. Yeah, these are these are. Uh, folks that in an, in a D&D setting, people would be worshipping with their clerics and whatnot. Only traditionally in Lankmar, there's no spiritual power to be gotten from most of the gods. It's certainly not from a you know a, a cleric perspective or throwing out uh, prayers and stuff is not really what folks do in that world. Right. You don't really have that. But uh, so the things that make Lankmar unique is for its its stance on religion. Uh, uh, it would have been the first place – it's not unique anymore, but it's the first place that gave us the Thieves' Guild. It yes. is the setting that gave us the Thieves' Guild. Yes. The, 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 in fact, it's called the uh, the Thieves' Guild of Lankmar, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, straight up. But also uh, people are always talking about the Thieves' Guild, but they kind of skip over the fact that the Thieves' Guild specifically had contracts with the Slayer's Brotherhood. Oh, yeah. So not only did we get a Thieves' Guild, we got a Cult of Assassins. Yeah. And they have a pretty interesting way of like taking people out too that they don't like. They have uh, assassins that will copy everything about you to to the point where they will become your basically impersonator in order to take you down because then they will know how you think. Yep. I like that. I thought that was neat. <laughs> almost – almost, yeah. And the way it's described, they become almost like doppelgangers. Yeah. You know, the way it described them in the, a couple of the stories where they're referenced, it's like that. Yeah, they have the interesting set too that I think we've seen. I'm not certain if Lankmar, if Old Fritz was the first. But I do know that if they take a contract, he was one of the first that if they take a contract and fail, you're, you're out. They have – they have their own sense of honor and the Slayer's Brotherhood. If you take out the assassin that came after you, right. that's that. Well, there's also uh, – there's a lot of unique things about Lankamar per se. But it's it, it always does strike me a little bit as uh, – you know, it's kind of like looking at a, a, a fantasy city through the lens of someone like uh, – a little bit of Terry Pratchett, a little bit of uh, – of, uh, <clears throat> 
the guy who made Brazil and Time Bandits. Oh yeah, Terry, Terry Gilliam. Gilliam. Terry Gilliam. Yeah, yeah. for sure. A, li- a, a little bit through that lens because like most of like like the general of the armies is this senile, doddering old coot, and the like the overlord of the city is you know either either a, a, a witless fool or a you know a guy who pets kittens all day and does nothing else or like some kind of you know grasping hugely ambitious you know politician it's these people are larger than life and they're they're done so in in ways that are both um virtuous and sinful right i mean it's 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 interesting yeah and they it's funny too it i i guess it's funny to touch a game a game of thrones sentiment that i swear comes right back from Lankmar. Yeah, Valor Morgulis, all men die, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everything Ross just said, all these powerful people, they come and go. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. None of them are, are – are, it, 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 this is, of course, predating Game of Thrones by quite a bit. But there is oh, yeah. a, a, clearly a, 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 an influence on things later on down the line. Right. It, and obviously, I mean in, in the sense that uh, that cynicism that Fritz showed all throughout them comes out in Lankmar like – no, no power lasts, I guess would be – we could sit and think about like what would be the fundamental underpinnings of Lankmar, right? There is no power great enough to last save the gods in Lankmar. You well, know? death. Oh, yes. But even death fails, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, death does – even death is not infallible. That's true. Like, and, and death is personified. He has like an anthropomorphic – like I, kind of like uh, Terry Pratchett does. He is like an actual dude you can go meet. And like take things from, and cut deals with, and cut deals with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the uh, it's funny. Uh, I you just reminded me, Ross, of one of the great other things I've been like more that ongoing thing that he talks about that the gods of chance are perhaps greater than the gods of destiny. Oh yes, they all like <laughs> they wager on things. The, the gods will just look down randomly at Lankamar and be like, "Ah, oh, that guy. Yeah, <laughs> let's see what happens with him." Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, even so, even the, the the great and good, like even the, the the host of heaven, the gods themselves are kind of petty beings, right? Yeah, totally. Which is interesting, um, and random shit can just happen too. Like, uh, there's that one adventure where Fafnir and the Great Mouser are basically is doing their own thing, and out of nowhere, this cult summons this bizarre creature made out of a cloud, and it's it t- starts controlling people and turning them into you know hate filled rage mongers. <laughs> and fact, for the Green Master, like, well, what the hell, dude? We were just, you know, <laughs> we were trying to drink. <laughs> we were just trying to just have trying to like have a party, and then all of a sudden, this cloud of hate comes out of nowhere. Yeah, they definitely had stuff like that happen. They uh, one of the funny ones is uh, especially talking about the anthropomorphization of death was when death has a quota set by you know a rule and the law, yeah. and so he's supposed to waste so many people. And he looks around and his quota is literally like a quota, like, you know, 30 peasants, 20 this, two this. <laughs> and then in the back end, and it's two heroes. So he kind of looks around and he goes, well, Fafford and the Great Master have served me really well. They've killed a lot of guys, but uh, I guess it's their time. Yeah. So he allows himself all this theatricality to kill them, all these mystical things, because that's what will be proper to take them out. Because people expect this when heroes die. And right? that is, in fact, the, <laughs> that, that particular story is the problematic one we were discussing earlier. Yes. Oh, in, oh yeah, you're right. It is that one. Oh, yeah. anyway. Uh, which uh, is otherwise a great story. Yeah, exactly. So he basically conjures up a horrible death for them, which they defeat mainly through luck. <laughs> Chance. And, then, then, and then death is like, OK, you know what? I gave it my best shot. I'm moving on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, well, I guess I'll use them again for something else. I'm going to kill these twins. <laughs> All right. So let's take a quick break. OK. And then we'll come back and jump back into it. So, have we started piquing your interest about Lankmar and the adventures of Farford and the Grey Mouser? Well, the easiest way to catch up on them is with Audible. Sign up now at audibletrial.com slash gamers tavern and it will give you a free trial of everything Audible has to offer, including a free book. Start with Swords and Deviltry, the first collection of the Lankmar stories, or go with something completely different. It's up to you to pick your favorite of the over 180,000 different books to get for free. So sign up for your free trial at audibletrial.com slash Gamers Tavern. And we're back with the new episode of the Gamers Tavern podcast, speaking to T.S. Lukert about Lankmar. And we just got done to sort of 
giving you some feedback on the things that make the setting unique. Although I think we missed one, and I want to I want to bring this up to TS because this is one of my favorite, absolute favorite things about Lankamar. TS, can you tell us about Lankamar Below? <laughs> the first Undercity, <laughs> the first Undercity of fantasy. Yeah. So, so arguably, we we could we could get pretty far along the suggestion that Fritz created Skaven. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> we could definitely make that, uh, strongly make that. So Lankmore Below is a place where apparently the rats are pretty darn sentient, like a lot more so than people think. And it's implied that there's whole kingdoms going on below Lankmore, in part ruled by rats and their kin, some of which seem very, basically they can walk in human flesh. Which is uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, they like there. There are sort of not necessarily they're not really weird rats, but they're not, yeah they're people that are related to like the rats of interbred somehow. Yes, and the, it kind of in that creepy Ari Howard way with the people of the stone circle, you know that like well they were once upon a time you know rats, but now they've evolved to being very people like. And actually, um, here's a quick thing: the Wikipedia entry for Skaven says they are inspired by the intelligent rats of uh, Swords of Lankamar. So, yeah. Oh, there you go. I didn't actually realize it was blatantly <laughs> – that they blatantly stated that. But, yeah, they definitely uh, – that was one of the inspirations for that. I just kind of remember the naughty thing that when uh, Grey Master meets the one gal, he's uh, – Is that – yeah, he's surprised by some of her attributes, and we'll leave it at that. Well, no, he speculates. He spe- I don't think he ever like confirms it, but he speculates that his that may have multiple bosoms like a rat would. Yep. And I don't think that's ever confirmed or not, but it's it's mentioned at least once or twice. And he's like, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, especially the two of them. They were always hanging out with unusual girls. Well, his was definitely unusual. Um, and then she had a bunch of white rats – that were like the council. This is where the, you get the council of thirteen. Yeah, yeah, Skaven. the council of thirteen. You get this. She has a council of white rats that lead the the rats of, of Lankamar below, and these guys are pretty. I mean, okay, they're rat sized. Okay, so they're not human sized or anything, but they're pretty sweet. Like they have their own political uh, agendas, and they have like guys who are professional duelists wielding tiny rat sized rapiers, and they have. You know, like these schemes to conquer Lankamar above, and they almost do. Like they're the one of the greatest threats to Lankamar has ever faced was freaking rats. <laughs> Not even yeah. making this up. Well, yeah, and actually, anybody that's played uh, Peterson and um, you know Luke Crane's Mouse Guard know how dangerous mice can be. Yeah. Well, these guys are <laughs> way more ruthless, though. Than, yeah, they're far more ruthless than the uh, Mouse Guard are depicted as. Yeah, they, they do some pretty – they're definitely the villains of the piece. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, unquestionably. Yeah, so what else What else do we need to know about Lankmar Below? It kind of implies that Lankmar itself – It's a Lankmar is built in a swamp for all intents and purposes. Yeah, it's on the edge of the uh, Great Salt Swamp. Yeah, on the, and it's implied that Lankmar is built upon other Lankmars. Many times he suggests that Lankmar is so old, it rests on the foundations of previous Lankmars that have been shoved down into the mud. Right. And – Lankmar below, there's definitely like a, a kind of this whole palaces and other things that have been lost to the world above have been shoved down below. So when you've got, you know, traveling below Lankmar, you're like, oh, it's not just, oh, I'm traveling through a sewer. You know, you're like seeing whole areas, whole houses and whole huge open areas that aren't just like what we think of as, say, the Underdark. Instead, it's like Lankmar, old, old Lankmar <laughs> shoved down under the ground. Yeah. I mean, this is not to say that Lankamar Below is the is, – it's a, probably my favorite thing, but it's not the coolest thing about Lankamar. If you had to pick the coolest thing about Lankamar, what would you say? I first – Lankamar is the one that first made me really think that magic had been – till I first started reading the Lankamar stuff. Magic was always this highway fantasy magic. Like most of the stuff that I'd read was pretty over-the-top stuff. I hadn't yet gone around to Conan when I first read it. So I really liked his depiction of magic. It's rare and nasty. And when it works, it works really well. And it's devastating. 
right? Spells in their world are just devastating. If you're capable of getting them off, they tend to be really bad news. Uh, you know, we know that uh, Grey Mouser dabbles in magic. And yeah, black really, sorcery specifically. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It kind of really gets his hands burned and goes, whoa, this is dangerous stuff. And he mostly leaves it alone. And it's really one of those, like, it depicts magic as being very, very dangerous, which I realize now that might seem like, oh, that's old hat. But to me, it was the first thing that magic was really ruthlessly dangerous. And I, I like that about Alankmar a lot, that it was not something to be taken lightly. I like the fact that almost everything is stratified. It lets you be a rebel. Like, the fact that Fafford and the Grey Master are not in the Thieves' Guild. You know, when, when they go right. out of their way to have this super intricate thieves guild, and then you have these two guys that right off the bat are such badasses, like screw the thieves guild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's they make a they make a point of uh, going against the strictures and the the policies of the thieves guild. Absolutely. And we're talking I about do. badass. I actually grabbed my copy of D's and Gimme Gods, and it has Farford and uh, Gray Mouser statted out. Gray yep. Mouser is a 15th level thief, thief, 11th level fighter. Third level magic user with uh, strength 16, intelligence 18, wisdom 14, dex 19, charisma 18, and, uh, and uh, constitution 17. <laughs> Farber yeah, is, is a, uh, his 18 double zero for strength, intelligence 17, wisdom 14, dex 18, con 18, charisma 17. I want the dice that these guys well, listen, use. <laughs> there's, there's, basically, there's basically three eras of these two guys. Okay. Yeah. There's the initial, their callow youths just starting their careers era. Okay. And at their, at their beginning, they're still pretty sweet. They're still pretty skilled dudes. Right. But they're not, they're not ridiculously amazing. And then there's the peak of their career. And the, the, the stats you're seeing there are kind of the peak of their career where they take on like most of the city's bravos who, Basically, everybody that owes that they owed money to got together and hired like a shit a shitload of mercenaries trying to kill them, <laughs> and they just them out. it didn't work. Fifth level uh, bard. So the, at the height at the height of their career, these two guys are absolutely legendary heroes. They can just they they take on uh, they take on these crazy iron uh, animated statues from another dimension and take them out. Right? Yeah, I, I forget the. I don't know if you remember which story it is. Do you, Ross? But when it literally the opening paragraph is the two of them left Lankmar not looking back and wandered the world for five years. Like, yeah, <laughs> literally they just go out and become total badass legends. <laughs> They're so it's pissed. True. Like, you know. And then and then there's the third the third era, which is their kind of the retirement era where they are still really good at what they do, but they have slowed down. They have entered middle age or you know, and, then, well, and they've also and they've also settled down. They've yeah. both found a woman that completes them, and they've both, you know, after years of playing around with all kinds of different philandering, girls, yeah, <laughs> philandering and doing whatever. The two of them have both met somebody they've fallen in love with, and they're settling down and looking to, you know. So yeah, there's definitely three different eras for their lives. So yeah, so those stats are just to be clear. Those stats are kind of showing them at their height. And just so to get, put it in perspective, here's the stat. Here's death's level: thirtieth level cleric, thirtieth level fighter. 30th level magic user, 30th level illusionist, 15th level assassin, and 23rd level bard. Dude, he's death. Why isn't he a higher level assassin? <laughs> Let's say Seriously. He's a greater god. Uh, move infinite. It's so funny. When we do that these days, you guys know what we do. We go, he's death. <laughs> you know, there'd be no stats. He's, he's death. death. <laughs> yeah, because you know the, the, the adage is if you give it stats, yeah, that means they'll they kill, kill it. it. Yeah. He lives in a huge fort in the heart of Shadowland. What's he doing yes. on BBS? <laughs> <laughs> and you can get to this. You can actually like ride to the Shadowland. It's not it, – it's, it is kind of a separate uh, dimension but it's also kind of not. Yeah, but but I, will say, I will say this: the art in the deities and demigods is actually pretty cool. For, well, it's for Jeff them. D. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and Diesel of Force and uh, Yara Lotus and all those guys. You know, it's, I mean, it goes into some detail. They actually show detail of the of um, of uh, Grey Mouser's rapier in there. So, yeah, if, if uh, you get a Paul, chance to get a copy of that, tra track it down. I think it's Paul Jackways was also working on that back in the day. And that, and, and you just made an interesting point, you two, or you reminded me of a, another point that's kind of fun about Lankmar. As much as I love uh, magic items, as much as the next guy, Ross, yeah. it's kind of cool that he never really went in for magic swords or anything. That The two of them constantly lose their stuff and just keep renaming their swords the same thing. Yeah. yeah uh, mostly, uh, Jack the Jack Way, 
was the one. Yeah, let's see. Mouser carries scalpel cat's claw. and cla- cat's claw. Yeah, it, his, his, his rapier is scalpel and his dirk is cat's claw. And then I think it's gray wand. Yep. Yes. His Fafford's gray wand is his sword. And then a uh, heart seeker, seeker is the dark. Yeah, that's right. Right. Is his Dirk and they and they make it explicitly clear they are just keep renaming their weapons the same thing. They, they've yeah, lost they their use, swords or had them ripped off many times. Now they they encounter magic items and they do occasionally use them during the course of their adventures, you know, to to do various things. Um, but yeah, they they don't rely on them like a D and D adventurer would. Really quick, I just want to say let's let's go beyond the boundaries of the city. And let's talk about Naewon itself. Now, Naewon oh, is the yeah. world that surrounds Lankamar. Now, Daryl, do you know anything? How much do you know about Lankamar and Naewon? Uh, the only thing I know about Naewon is that it's no win backwards. Okay. W-H-E-N. It's uh, apparently <laughs> an, alluding to Erhuan, which is nowhere backwards, which was a different novel series by um, the world from doo, 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 uh, Samuel Butcher. From eighteen, back in uh, eighteen seventy two, Butler, Butler, Samuel, Butler. Butler. Sorry, I'm yeah, looking right no at it and I'm reading it wrong. <laughs> uh, it's uh, basically a satire of Victorian society. You know, Daryl, if you ever hire a guy to come to your house and you know help clean things up and keep it tidy, you don't want a butcher. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> B-U-T and it's an author it just fills into my head butcher so <laughs> wow that would really change the movie Clue wouldn't it <laughs> it's sending it in a whole different direction <laughs> I'm the butcher I like to keep right. the kitchen tidy <laughs> yeah no way dude I am leaving the house now all right but seriously like beyond beyond uh, the city walls of Lankmar you have the world of Nawan. TS, why don't you like pick some of the highlights of the world of Nawan? Let's talk about it. Well, um, for sure. The first thing, though, is the principle by which he built it, which is actually something that uh, uh, was covered a lot in some of the oh, – what's the indie thing? Ron's laughing at me. Uh, Ron's game. Um, On Mighty Thews? Oh, no. He's got the – he's got the – the one is about swords and demons or – oh, heck. I can't remember. Which Ron are we talking about? Ron Edwards. He's got the book that he wrote that Sorcerer was about – Sorcerer Zoe? No, he's got – he did the series of the sword and sorcerer stuff that he did. And he did one that basically talks about the accretion method that uh, that Labor used. So, sorry, not to lose everybody. The point is Fritz started with Lankmar and it was the center of all things. And he didn't need to create anything else until – the boys went out adventuring into other places. So he set Lankmar at the center of his world, the greatest and most noble city, right? And then he slowly built outwards from there. When Fafford and the Grey Master had to go someplace, well, then he'd just create the place and then write down what he created as they slowly expanded out, right? It's uh, in many ways what I think uh, China Mieville did with his Boslag series. If you two have ever read Perdido Street Station. Yes, Right. It's very much that same, like the greatest city of the world at all things that happen are at New Crobazon and everything else builds out from there. Right. I think Fritz really did that with Lankmar. So we start with this amazing city and then he just added on cool stuff as he thought of it. <laughs> if you look at the world of New One, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense from the point of view of like we have such constructed worlds these days in a lot of role playing settings they think about a lot of things and they say okay i'm going to fill in all this stuff and this is going to be here and this is going to be there and if you look at some of the there's maps actually you could find the of uh, you know what new one looks like it's just this kind of hodgepodge of different places that are you know thrust in different weird areas they don't even necessarily geographically make sense <laughs> right but it does but it does contain a lot of really Interesting and unique places and people and things. Oh like, yeah, there's a there's a mountain called Stardock. Let's just start oh, there. Yes. There's a mountain called Stardock, and this is like one of their Everest, you know, K two giant freaking mountains. Okay, yep. and their legends are that on on top of Stardock there is this you know wondrous place, and it's, it turns out to be true. When the two guys, when uh, Fafford and the Grey Master go there, they encounter this kingdom basically of people who are completely invisible. Who ride, get this, they ride invisible manta rays that also fly through the air. Yep. 
And but, tell me but, if that's not unique. That is completely unique. That's unique, but in keeping with our boys, you remember why they're there, right? It was a bet. Uh, no, they're there for the diamonds. Well, it, I thought it was a yeah. wager between them and the and the other guys. That, well, anyway, yes, it, it's, they, they right. were they were treasure hunting. They weren't yeah, doing it for exploration. They were. You're doing right. It. On the one level, you're right. They were betting that they could make it to the top of Star Dog, but they were also expressly there because there were supposed to be diamonds that were invisible, so clear that the diamonds themselves were invisible if they right. weren't in the right light. Right. So they were always out for money, right? <laughs> They'd show up at the oddest places. They usually had an ulterior motive. Right. But uh, I'm saying, you know, in terms of his setting, this is a really interesting and oh, unique yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. That, that city, the Lords of Cormall. So you right? have this subterranean realm. Oh, yeah. Now, this is beneath the earth. And what, tell us about Cormall. Well, Cormall was interesting because they set it up in a very different way than Lankmar. He's like, he wanted, I think he wanted to have a big contrast, right? So with Cormall, you've got all these super stratified people with really weird customs and the lower you go in the city, the more powerful you are. It's so, also bleak. It's just really bleak. Oh, yeah. It's there. really bleak. But it's this weird it, – it's kind of a – I think he was one of the first to do that really, to turn that on its head that actually the people that were lower, they were a higher class because we almost always – we have those associations. Oh, you're high up. You must be high up. So he kind of turned Cormol on its head by going, oh, actually, the lower you are, the more dangerous you are. That That's where the nobles dwell. Well, and this is also where you get like some weird like guys, basically mutants. You know, they're, they're yeah. down there. Oh, you know what? We glossed over something by having the mutants. Nuon doesn't have all the other uh, races. It's almost entirely human with a couple of variations. Yeah, it's a, you know, you, you could say that uh, that is true. Although the, the people it, – it's said that the people who live in uh, Stardock are – a completely different race. Right. There's something else. And then like the ghouls of Nuon are kind of interesting. Oh, let's talk about the Nuon ghouls, but I want to, <laughs> I want to get back to Quarmall too. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, cool. Because there's more to say about Quarmall. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's the Nuon ghouls. Now, the Nuon ghouls, there's actually te- – technically there's two different types of ghouls. But the ones we're introduced to the most are these guys that are human, but their flesh is transparent. But their bones aren't. So you, yeah, they look like they look like a walking skeleton, but it's really you're just seeing through their transparent flesh, and uh, they are savage cannibals. They are absolutely like they will. They're like the Celts, you know, fighting the Romans. They will come after you naked because that's you know the better to put the the fear of God into you, and then <laughs> then they'll kill you and then they'll eat you. Which doesn't prevent Fafford from becoming friendly with one. And very if you're friendly. very very and if you're very very lucky, they'll do it in that order. <laughs> yeah, they're not exactly reavers, but they actually come to the the rescue of Lankamar at one point, um, which is interesting. But yeah, yeah. Well, he's got this great line about how good she looks with the makeup on her face in the firelight because he can actually see like parts of her flesh. Oh, no, 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 that's that's actually the invisible people. That's not the ghouls because oh. when, when they get together with the invisible people, they end up with uh, the two princesses, and they oh yeah, they, that's where the makeup uh, comes into play. Because they would – otherwise you wouldn't be able to see oh, them at un- all. They're invisible. They're completely invisible, yeah. Uh, uh, that means that he – that one is when he comments on how lovely her bones look in the firelight. Yeah, no, that – yeah, that's true. Their bones look <laughs> That was Fafford. Oh, man. So, so we talked about that. Let's go back really quick to, to Quamarol. Oh, oh, to Quamarol. What's interesting in Quamarol, they have these kind of weird mutant guys that live down there. And the, and the guy in charge is this essentially immortal sorcerer. And they, they have like giant fans – that have to be constantly be pushed by – it's kind of like – imagine you know Conan on the wheel, right? They have people <laughs> totally. like that turning fans to keep the air moving down there. Yep, to keep the air fresh down in the under parts of the city. And there's people that have evolved like there's a sort of a sub race, if you will, that has evolved pushing the fans and that's all they know, right? That's all – that's their entire life. They grow up, they live, they die pushing those damn fans. Um, and then you have like this uh, – they have a weird uh, – Society full of sorcerers and slaves and uh, internal conflict and civil war. It's just – it's crazy. Cornwall is a place I don't – personally like that's the one place I would not want to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Stardock, OK. I'll visit Stardock but I'm not going down to Cornwall. <laughs> Screw that. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's interesting too because – you know, he was definitely influenced. Well, Fritz was definitely influenced by Lovecraft too, like so many guys from that generation, right? right. You've got places like, you know, he's got the mountains of the Elder Ones. He has the Cold Waste, which he definitely was drawn on Kadath on the Cold Waste when he created the Cold Waste. 
there's no doubt in my mind that that's where he took that name from because especially because beyond cold waste lies the uh, the desolation of the old ones and how how lovecraftian is that you know? oh well there's 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 definite references to lovecraft there's monsters in the world that they briefly mentioned that are from lovecraft I can't remember exactly the one right off the yeah top he's of my head. got there's- i think he's got gugs he's got the ones that were from uh the dreamlands underworld well, I can, I can look that up, but let's let's pick another part of the setting and talk about that. Why don't you tell our listeners about um, – how about we talk about Smorgia? It's Smorgia. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. Am I pronouncing it wrong? No, um, actually, I think you're pronouncing it – you're probably pronouncing it right, but I honestly barely remember Smorgia. <laughs> <laughs> you can remind me and I'll see if I can remember. So Smorgia was this kingdom that sunk into the sea. Oh, 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 right. And the whole kingdom is still down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it the inner sea? It's one of their – it's either the it's either the sea of the east or the inner sea. He had a couple of different ones. But well, yeah. Was, and, and the people that, that used to live there are now these weir sharks. Right. They adapted can, to their new home. They, they're, they're basically weir sharks and they can command – they have like a, a they have like an Aquaman relationship with fish where they can summon like a giant whale to come take your ship apart and stuff like that. Right, and they have to be uh, generally they they say they placate them or avoid their waters at different times. Yeah, There's that whole thing about yeah they have to be placated or completely avoided because if you don't tie to them they'll just wipe out your ships. There, there's that one like like there's a weird Atlantis city that rises up every so often just to tempt people to come in and then it goes back down into the water. <laughs> and then down you go. Yeah, yeah. They have some pretty that's that's like a really weird, interesting place. How about the treasure house of Ergon or of Agar, of Agargi? I'm not pronouncing that very well. The treasure house. You know which one I'm talking about. Oh yes. I was actually I thought the jewels in the forest. Yes, from of jewels the different. In the like, yeah, when you're talking about different uh, classic places, that is uh, that is really cool. That is a uh, one of my favorite expressions of that. And I'm not going to remember the poem. You're probably not either, are you? <laughs> oh, I could I could find it. <laughs> yeah, I bet you could. There's this fantastic poem that brings Fafr once again on the quail, a quest for treasure, but brings out Fafrin and the Gray Master into the great forest to the north to find this legendary treasure. And even in the poem, it, bra- I'm, it brags about like massive rubies and jewels and whatnot. But it says there's no trap in this tower. There's no no guardian, no this, no that. You know, no traps, no locks, no bars, no. And yet you'll die. And it, it kind of totally sucks the boys into this. And that's one of my favorite stories. And that's actually one of his earlier ones too in the collection. Yeah, but the thing is, the, the deal is with this. What, what what he's talking about is that the big treasure spoiler. house. <laughs> Yeah, big spoiler alert, right? But the treasure house itself is a living thing. Yeah, the gems that the boys are after, that Fafford and the Grey Master are after, they are exactly what it says they are. There is a diamond as big as their head. There are rubies as big as their fists. But these gems hold the sorcerer's sentience. It's almost like the precursor for the demi lich in a sense, right? Yeah, because he put his he put the he put a sentience into the gems that then animates the treasure house itself. Right. So this entire tower is a weapon. And Fritz Labor has the greatest descriptions of when they find the remains of these guys. And they're trying to figure out what yeah, happened. What, what killed them. There's no, no weapons or anything around, no footprints. You know, what killed them? <laughs> yeah. And like Fafford's like inspecting one of the bodies and he's like, this has been, you know, he's been flattened. He's been just like his bones have been ground to dust. And there's just he just can't figure out how this is happening and how it could happen so fast. And what it turns out is that the, the 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 treasure house itself can flail around and smack people, you know, with its tower. It can crush you with its interior walls. Yeah, effectively one entire animated. T- okay, it, but it's the tower itself is animated. Here's here's the the poem. <clears throat> oh, got it. Okay, cool. Uh, For although my treasure house be empty as air, no deadly creature in rocky lair, no sentinel outside anywhere, no pitfall, poison trap, or snare. Above and below the whole place bare, of demon or devil not a hair. No serpent lethal fanged yet fair, no skull with a mortal eye a glare, yet I have left a guardian there. Let the wise read this riddle and forbear. <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome. Right. And that, of course, coupled with the legendary treasure that the sorcerer accumulated in his lifetime because he was famously greedy and, to me and that famously like, loved jewels. To me, OK, so this when I was like, uh, you know, 12, you know, this is my, you know, 
probably first edition D&D, that's what I thought adventures were like, is you would come across, you know, some kind of riddle like that, and you'd be like, oh, we've got to go here. We've got to go check this out, right? You know? Yep. Fools that laugh at death. Yes, and that's who they are. That's exactly who Pfeffer and the Great Master are. So what are some other areas of Nawan we're leaving out? Uh, the cold, cold corner. We're leaving out cold corner. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, Fafford's? Where yeah, you, that's where Fafford's clan is from. Yeah, the eight cities this, of Trollstep Mountains. They don't really go to the Trollstep Mountains. I mean, he's got a lot of things that he refers to, like like so many authors, right? He's got great right throwaway on. stuff that he'll talk about. The Eastern Lands, as an example. You know that there's the uh, – okay. what's it called? It's like the Grand Citadel of the King of Kings or something. He makes a big point about there's a huge empire to the far east. Haborxen. Haborxen. H o r b o r i x e n. Yeah, it, there's a. I, they definitely make a point where at one point does it <laughs> does it uh, Gray Mouser say something about like sand sand disagrees with my constitution. Like <laughs> he's not really interested in going far from a city, you know. But uh, so the cold waste. So the cold waste is a super harsh environment, and that's where Fafford comes from. And they have a whole very strict thing about civil. They f- regard civilization as totally decadent. They think of themselves as being pure because they live out in the cold and they're, the waste. They're barbarian tribes, basically. Yeah, totally. They're hardcore barbarians. Except uh, he was one of the first. They're matriarchal. They are barbarian tribes, but uh, the women, while the men think they call the shots, he makes it really clear that the cold witches, the women, are really ultimately the ones that make the decisions. They're called the snow women. Yeah, the snow women. And they basically have the implication being they have different uh, control, magical control over ice and snow and wind and whatnot. And when the women – Well, they do. The, they totally yeah, do. <laughs> they clearly do. When the men don't do as they're told or don't cooperate with what the women are asking them, they basically uh, in theory do things to punish them using the ice and the snow. Yeah, well, and and Fafford, this is part of the reason why he leaves his home and ends up. Right. He's Fa- he's seeking civilization. He doesn't. Right. Fafford like, explicitly so. believes that his mother might have killed his father for defying right. her, and his father was well known for being willful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and and the, obviously the son following after the father. Right. Right. Oh, I found the uh, the the uh, Lovecraft creature. It's the Night Gaunt. Oh, the Night Gaunt. Yes. The night gaunts are the ones that are um, explicitly mentioned a couple times. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, there's that. Uh, Cold Corner, we talked about that. We talked uh, – have we talked about – again, there's some really, just really great stuff out there. Have we talked about them going to the Howling Tower or the Bleak Shore or the uh, the Earth Priests – you know, with their weird like volcanic caverns and stuff. Oh, with their all the extended cavern thing. We haven't, but neither have we touched upon their two patrons either. So oh, we do we need to talk to about. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about. the Will TS? Uh, well, actually, hang on a second. Let's see if Daryl knows this one. Daryl, okay. Do you know who the patrons are? Nope. Of Fafford the Grey Mouser. Nope. All right. TS, help them out. <laughs> so they each have a patron sorcerer. And there's a lot of interesting implications with these two, right? It's Let's see if no, – talk about pronouncing it. <laughs> it's Ning, Ningable, yes. Ningable of the Seven Eyes, which are sometimes six, <laughs> depending, yeah. and uh, Shilba of the Eyeless Face. Right. And ironically enough, Ningable's the super talker and he's, he's Fafford's patron and Shilba's the super taciturn one and she – well, she, he, it is – uh, Gray Mouser's patron. So these are clearly non-human beings. They're not even from our dimension, right? They oh yeah, explicitly not. Explicitly not from our dimension, but they're the most powerful sorcerers supposedly uh, in all Nawan, and they are they have inscrutable motives for the most part. Well, the interesting thing is, I, I agree with you that they're most powerful. But one of the ongoing implications is their powers were dirne- directly connected, in part, to their being patrons of these two great heroes. Correct. They kind of imply that, yes, Ningable is very powerful, but it was his patronage of Fafford that made him truly powerful. Yes, Shilba was very powerful, but taking on Grey Mouser gave her, her, he, it, whatever, greater power. And the two of them are total rivals. They don't like each other very much. But because the pair make the two of them powerful, they both tolerate the other. Right. 
because they know that there's kind of this implication that comes up uh, explicitly stated that Fafford and the Grey Mouser sometimes believe that they are the soul of one great hero from the past split into two bodies. It's weird because they, they end up like going to our Earth for a little while and stuff like that too. It's, it's, yeah. it's strange. It's uh, later on. It's very strange. Like their, their adventures are – I don't want to say surreal because they're not, but they're <laughs> but their adventures sometimes make you go, wow, that is just really out there. And that's part of the reason why Lankamar as a setting becomes a really interesting place to play because it, it, it kind of almost anything is possible. And and that's interesting to me. I, I like that it has that very cool old school sword and sorcery, you're not really sure what's around the next corner kind of feel. And I guess that's going to lead me to this question. Now that you've heard all about Naewon and, and – well, Lankamar and Naewon, um, Daryl, what kind of adventures or campaigns do you see as something that you would run in, in a setting like this? I've got ideas floating through my head like crazy right now. I'm, even, <laughs> even if it's not stuff I'm, I may not set it in Lankamar, but just – it's churning ideas in my head over stuff I can do in any, any sort of like urban fantasy setting. Um hmm. Basically, like you were saying, I always really like the idea of rumors and stuff like you, you overhear things that poem you were talking about. Oh, hey, there, that sounds like treasure. Let's go do it. And I've never had a group of players who ever chased those down. So even, even doing that, I might be able to have a little bit more carrot in the adventures rather than the stick of prod in them. Okay. The adventures this way. Go save the princess. Well, there's something so. to be said. I think there's something to be said for. I, this is probably the wrong term to use, but it's, there's something you said for just random adventure where you're out doing something and all of a sudden something else happens and now you're in an adventure. Um, well, well, I'll give you T something that I think about a lot these days in adventure design. And it's interesting because I've written a lot of adventures for publication. But one of the things that I think that's most efficient for people running the campaign, and I'll tell you too, if I ever figure out a way to do this, I, I will write it one day. I think Fallout 3 is one of the great first precursors to what a sandbox can be. And what the in the video game Fallout 3 did was it said, okay, I'm going to use this huge sandbox. And there's all these interesting things that can happen in different parts of the sandbox. And then there's going to be a couple of big storylines, but I'm not going to force anything on you as a player. I'm going to let you wander out and run into these things. And how we do that in a setting like Lankmar, explicitly what we're kind of talking about is you set up a bunch of this stuff like, you, you know, the poems and the riddles and the you listen to your players and you talk about it. Well, what, you know, you hit them with the Conan, you know, what's best in life for your character? What are, what's your character about? And as you figure out this different, you know, stuff that you can hook them with, you just start chucking out different things. And you don't even necessarily commit like as a GM, don't commit to any one thing. Just check it out there and see what they're going to do because that's what that setting kind of lends itself to, right? You guys can get into whatever trouble you want. If you want adventure, it's right outside the tavern door or maybe even in the tavern door. You just have to be willing to take it on. Yeah, because there, there's a story where they are literally sitting in a tavern bemoaning the lack of adventure and it's kind of, you know, the be careful what you wish for because the guy sits down and says, okay, you're now going out to do a thing. And that's where they walk, they leave and go away for five years. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, so this it, it is it is definitely a place where you can have those random kinds of adventures where it, it doesn't have to have, you know, overarching story arcs. It doesn't you, have to have just because the story is happening. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's the beginning, middle and end of the story. It's just the part that you happen to walk in on. Correct. You're the, <laughs> you're the guest star in this person's episode, th this person's TV show. And then you're exiting it, at the end of the episode. It's completely random to you, but it makes total sense to that other person. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're like explicitly – as an example, I think it's interesting with some games, especially with players, to sit down and explicitly glow, look, you guys are going to be in Lankmar for quite a while or actually we're going to be in Lankmar for a bit and then you guys can wander el elsewhere, right? Because the character you make – you're probably going to reconsider some of the characters you might make. If you make an exclusively urban mound character, you're not going to want to go traipsing off into the wilderness, right? If you say like, well, we're going to play in Lankmar and you guys pretty much aren't leaving the, the city for a while, it's going to influence what people want to do. But the neat thing with Lankmar is you can go like you two 
have both been at this as many years as I have. You know how players respond to restrictive groups and rules. <laughs> it's like nails on a chalkboard for, you know, for role players. And the Thieves Guild is all about rules. Like you can even set them up like, OK, you've got jo- guys have joined the Thieves Guild. And you're like, awesome. What do we get to do? You're going to go pickpocket urchins for the next three years until we think you're worthy to do something. Screw that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Do you know any players, any at all that are like, oh, screw you? <laughs> like, you don't even have to go out of your way to do it. The most folks will turn against the Thieves Guild like that. Here's, here's the thing I've been thinking about is there's actually one of the novels for Lankmar was called Two Sought Adventure. OK. Oh, yeah. And if you think about that, if you just think about those words, right? Lankmar as a setting is the kind of place for adventure. And I don't mean adventure. We, we've kind of – in the gaming industry, when we say adventure, it's, it's lost some of that old meaning that it had. But when I say adventure with regards to Lankamar, it is that unusual, hazardous, exciting experience. It is absolutely the exploration of the unknown. It is absolutely – undertaking an enterprise you, you're you're going let's go do a thing and it's yeah, going to be totally. risky and it's going to be exciting and we may not survive there's going to be peril there's going to be danger there's going to be threats and that's what i think is kind of at the heart of lankamar is that's the kind of adventure that you're going to find there this i get a similar sense from like uh, the old gray box forgotten realms but but of course in a different tone and it's a different genre so with with that particular tone and with the idea of adventure being that that higher, you know, really pulse pounding kind of thing, I think that's where Lankmar really shines. Yeah, for sure. It's strange too that Lankmar has a piece of something that's always been really hard, I think, to capture in RPGs, unless you really have players that are down for it. And it's that concept. Lovecraft played with it a bit in his Dreamland cycle, but it's that desire to see something that no one else has seen. Right. Mm -hmm. That that drive to adventure is to go and do the thing that nobody has dared to do. And that's interesting to get that catch out of your players. They have to kind of be willing to do that. Right. You kind of have to embrace that spirit of, you know, yeah, let's go see this thing that no one else has seen, because otherwise you have to be willing to go along with that. I guess what I'm saying, you have to embrace that part of that genre of what Lankmar is, that you guys are going to go and do and see these amazing things. You're going to – adventure is going to find you or you're going to find it when you least expect it. And that and Lankmar certainly embraces that. And if you've you got a player that's like, well, you know, I, I just want to do my little thing and I don't want to do that stuff, I'm not certain they're going to be as happy with it as a group that's gung-ho, you know, like, yeah, let's go find the, you know, cursed treasure of Mortai. We can lift the curse. We're immortal. You know, we're yeah. going to live forever because we're young adventurers, right? We're going to live forever. Let's go do it. Yeah, if you have the right, it, it's kind of like you know people that love seventies exploitation movies that want to play Spirit of seventy seven. Yeah, totally. Right? If you have those people that like the idea of sword and sorcery as sword and sorcery, then Lankamar is perfect for that. And totally, you're saying what kind of adventures? It seems like it's the perfect place to kind of uh, like you were saying, sandbox pepper. Just the world. It's a living world. There are things that go on, even if the characters aren't interacting with it. And it's just a great way to throw out as many plot seeds as you can and see which ones they chase down and pick up. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's 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 definitely its own place. It's not, you know, Samaria. It's not uh, Mel de Binet, right? It is its own unique kind of setting. And I think... While it has a lot in common with those other two places I just named, or even uh, probably you know other stuff like Forgotten Realms or whatever, it's got some you know, pretty superficial connections to those things. It's still its own thing, and I, I think that if you like the the Fritz Lieber stories, if you like the idea of sword and sorcery, I, I guess I'm kind of wandering into my final thoughts right here right now. <laughs> so, Ross, what are your final thoughts on, on Lankmar? It's a really interesting, unique, distinct setting that I think is set apart from a lot of other settings and, and people who are into adventuring in uh, very nuanced places that have a lot going on and have a lot of – and don't necessarily want you know those really linear story-heavy type experiences. 
that's where Lankamars could come in and be your perfect, like, here you go, uh, and, and, and enjoy, you know, and, and get to be those roguish adventure types that, that you've always wanted to be. That's my, that's my final thoughts on Lankamar. What about you, uh, TS? What do you think your final thoughts are? It's certainly fun to play the rogue once in a while, right? <laughs> <laughs> and not just as like a not the not the idea of the class, right? You're using the the bronze. No, I, yeah, in the original sense, it's a, a character whose uh, morals are not far from their purse, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like that. Lankmar lets you embrace a lot of the. Uh, it's a setting where it's okay to do some dodgy gray things and not feel bad about yourself. <laughs> Because <laughs> the world lends itself to that, you know, and you know the people you're doing it to are horrible, horrible people. <laughs> so you don't really feel that bad about ripping them off because they're horrible people. There's a lot of villains. That's, yes, that's a good part. Like Cormal, the Lord of Cormal is also named Cormal, and yeah. he is he is a just reprehensible dude. Oh yeah, there is definitely a plethora of people, even in the base setting before you know a GM gets going and adding. That are just not pleasant. They're awful. So, yeah, yeah <laughs> they're really. He uh, Fritz is always really good at digging it in. Like you go, oh, this guy's kind of bad, and then like more details are revealed. And you're like, this guy's really bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> and usually, yeah, you just that, and that was definitely because you cheer the heroes on, right? If the guys that they're dealing with are so much, it's okay. They're both a little gray and they're thieves, right? Because the guys they're dealing with are so much worse. And I think he really went out of his way too. They never ripped off poor people, and they see even not even like middle class people. What's the score you're going to get against that? They were always after rich guys, you know, and, lost and, treasures or rich guys. And when it came down to it, they were heroes. They did save yeah. lives. They did you know the right thing. Just usually after some you know quibbling <laughs> over. I may be a bad guy, but I'm not a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, embracing the Wreck It Ralph spirit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Daryl, do you have any final thoughts on uh, Lankamar? Yeah, uh, Lankamar had always flown under my radar as a campaign setting because I didn't really know its history. Because every time I read it, I'd like skim over the description. I was like, okay, so it's Waterdeep then? But now that I'm seeing, oh, Waterdeep is Lankamar, not the other way around. Uh, it, one of my favorite settings in Forgotten Realms is Waterdeep, is that sort of urban intrigue kind of campaign where it's chaotic and even though there's order and that kind of mix and match thing has always appealed to me. So I'm actually thinking of going back to that. I've, I've talked about it on the show before. It was called the rogues campaign that uh, my old mm -hmm. DM ran uh, where we were set in water deep as uh, trying to set up a thieves guild. It sounds like something would be really cool to actually set in Lankmar instead. Oh, uh, it seems like it would fit in well. Yeah. From Lankamar, even if you didn't set it there. Yeah. And it's, it, I guess it's worth explicitly stating something that uh, we've kind of touched it many times, but without explicitly stating it, Ross. And it's this. Lankmar really went, look, man, you don't have to be the rogue class to be a rogue. Yeah. You don't have to be a thief to be a thief. Yeah. Right? They were both really more fighters who stole things. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> You know, they acquired I, wealth by hook yeah. or crook. <laughs> exactly. And that's really – I used to – I've told – actually, I've told my kids that. If you can play any class in D&D &D and be an assassin, an assassin takes money to kill people. Right. You, know, you can be a wizard assassin. You can be whatever you want if you want to – Does a wizard assassin mean I'm a wizard who's also an assassin or does it mean I'm an assassin who targets wizards? <laughs> Well, in this case, I specifically meant you can be the wizard class who okay. acts as an assassin because you expect accept money to waste people with your magic. Okay, that makes you a wizard who happens to be an assassin. Okay, you don't explicitly have to take levels in the assassin class or anything to say, "Hey, I'm an assassin," and that's what to me Lankmar was really like. I really of the two of them, Fafford was a, a fighter who stole things. You could have argued that. You know, Grey Mouser had definitely had some thief like rogue like skills, but the two of them were far more fighters than they were ever. They fighters that stole stuff. Well, you know, something that just occurred to me now as we're talking about it. You know, I I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, talking about the definition of adventure, and yeah. I think I think if you look at the exploits of Fafra and the Grey Mouser, and you look at Lankamar, and you look at the novels, this was a huge influence on early D&D &D in terms of what adventuring was supposed to be like, what it meant to be an adventurer. 
Oh yeah, comes from these two guys. Yeah, for sure. Not not in any small part, but it comes from a large part of what these two guys did. That so so when I say like that's kind of what I thought D and D was supposed to be like. I wasn't far off the mark. That is pretty Lieber, much what D and D was, was one like. of the uh, one of the first authors mentioned in the influences of D and D way before right. Tolkien was in Gary Gygax's original notes and uh, forward to D and D. Right. So I, so I was actually like I'll completely on target when I said that kind of thing. Oh yeah, for sure. It, it's definitely a lot of that stuff came from the uh came from there and what's more their two patrons ningle bull and shielba i think other than gandalf i think they're two of the most famous of like accessible warlocks that weren't necessarily bad guys think about how many of the guys that you ever met in conan if they could use magic they were evil yeah that's right? true <laughs> I, at the, or at the bear he had that one friend that was kind of used their magic for neutral stuff or to stop bad guys but generally speaking you know if you dealt in the black arts you were bad bad news and while steel you know, isn't strong boy yeah, flesh, is, flesh strong. is yeah exactly <laughs> so and the two of them you know Ningable and uh and Shilba, while they're both creepy, they're never depicted as evil. They yeah. actively went out of their way to help the two. They went out yes. of their way to stop bad things from happening. So they were never depicted as evil, just weird. <laughs> and for the descriptions and deities and demigods, a little bit petty at times. Very petty. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Totally petty. There's no yep. question about that. <laughs> petty and serious rivalries with each yeah, other. Yeah, I believe too. it was described as um, if the gray mouser must go to exotic bird and pick a feather, then Falfer must go and kill a rock and bring the entire body back. <laughs> And when you say rock, you mean the R O C giant bird, yeah, yeah. R O C the big one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think that's pretty. Uh, you know, it, unless we got anything else left to say, I think that's going to wrap us up on Lankamar as a setting. I got to go check down the novels now. <laughs> I I don't know if there's a present edition out. I, I should think, hope uh, there is. Yeah, I was I was uh, browsing on Amazon. They've got it for Kindle. So. Oh, great. So I can I can start reading in as soon as we're done here. Oh yeah, I'm. I would recommend it. Of all the ones that I know, a lot of folks actually have been started reading their uh, the inspirations for D and D again. They had the list of the books, and a lot of folks have been talking about going back trying to read those original inspirations. Oh, of of all of them, I absolutely you cannot not read Ilmet and Lankmar one day. It is amazing. So it's me, one of the greatest this, novellas ever. Let me throw out one last thing. So I just okay. I was recently I was just thinking about this a little bit more, but Lankmar is this. It's it's a decadent setting. Where being a rogue, like we talked about, like these guys, what they're rogues, that's basically a requirement of survival. Mm-hmm. It's not – it's a fact of life. It's not – it's not that these guys choose to be thieves and scoundrels. This is – that's why I, 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 I kind of threw away the Han Solo. I'm like it's not really Han Solo because Han Solo chooses to do that in a world where you don't it's have to. It's the gentleman to. bastards. Yeah. It, it has a lot in common with, with, uh, with the gentleman bastards. It's true. But this that is, is – a- that's a very good point, and I'll ask Scott about that at Gen Con. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Scott's going to Gen Con. That's awesome. Yeah, he's he'll be at Gen Con this can year. You, can so. you do us a favor and ask him if he'd like to be a guest on our show? Oh, sure thing. So explicitly for everybody, that's Scott Lynch. Yes. So he's going to be yeah. at Gen Con. Uh, actually, all kinds of our now becoming famous writer brethren are at Gen Con this year. Chuck Wendig's going to be at Gen Con. That's too. Office. So, so for for people who don't know, um, Scott Lynch's first book, which uh, is really well known out there, is called "The Lies of Locke Lamora." And before that, he was an RPG designer who created uh, "Deeds Not Words," which is a superhero RPG that you can find on RPG Drive Through RPG. Yep. Uh, and has uh, I have actually a book that has an inscription by uh, from him to Alan Varney. You can pass that on if you like. Oh, cool! Uh, back when Alan was doing a lot of work on the hero system, so uh, Scott is a guy who has a lot of superhero stuff in his background uh, which is awesome and uh, we're Daryl and I are just huge fans of his work yeah so. oh cool and the, yeah so and the two of them and then Chuck Wendig who's now becoming really famous because he took on one of the new Star Wars novels but uh, Chuck's got really cool stuff and he back in the day wrote a bunch of stuff for Hunter for White Wolf cool so he or various other things so. he's not going to drop a moon on Chewbacca is he? <laughs> I don't think that's the plan but uh, he's he made a lot of jokes about an Ewok Jedi <laughs> <laughs> we'll listen, see if that horror comes to pass. Oh my god, listen. You know, I, I worked on Edge of the Empire. Okay. And I tell the story a lot, but part of the thing about working on Edge of the Empire was sorting through Wikipedia. And it's like panning for gold. There's an awful <laughs> lot of stupid in the Star Wars universe. Pri- prior to Disney throwing all of that expanding universe I stuff away, I still remember that there, had there to, was a there lot was, of stupid. Lucas had to make an edict to say no more Wookiee Jedi. Well, there's, would you believe? 
for example, we're, we're wandering off topic. Or whatever, <laughs> so last, it's, it's the end of the show. Would you believe there is a hut Jedi who died in a lightsaber duel with Leia Organa? <laughs> I'm not making this up. There is Skippy. Skippy the Jedi droid is a thing. There are five different races of anthropomorphic rabbits. I mean, I could go on and on. Wow. It's, it's, Star Wars had so much stupid in it. I, the, the part of it so yeah. This is one of the reasons why I was really happy that you know, even being even being a guy who contributed to the expanded universe, it was time to clean it was house. time to clean house. <laughs> I think I'm really glad they did. I, I will take I will take five anthropomorphic species of rabbits if I can have General Thrawn back or Grand Admiral Thrawn. Grand, Grand Admiral Thrawn is amazing and should definitely uh, should never go away. That's absolutely true. All right, so let's uh, let's wrap this up. We're going to ask TS to tell us where we can find out more about him. And what his latest thing is that we should be keeping an eye out for. Okay. So uh, you can most easily find me these days at cubicle7.co.uk because Cubicle 7 is an English company. And uh, if you haven't heard of the One Ring, you really should check out the One Ring. One game for <laughs> them all. One Indeed. Game uh, expli- explicitly, if you haven't heard of it, explicitly built from the ground up to actually feel like you're in Middle Earth with uh, systems – specifically built around Tolkien's terminology and feeling like you're in Middle Earth. And while that's kind of a weird thing to convey to people, I ask around. A lot of people that are played are like, holy crap, I'm, this is amazing. This feels like the books. So, Which means like many of the tales of Middle Earth, it's sometimes a sad game to play and grim and shadowy at times, but also there are fair things within it. So I have Runes of the North is out, and I am one of the primary authors of... Horse Lords of Rohan that comes out later this year and has been desperately awaited because that lets you play the Rohirrim, the uh, Eorlingus, the Swift Sons of Eorl. So a lot of people have been very much waiting for that source book for quite a while. Cool. You know, strangely enough, I used to work with a guy named Sean Murphy, and he was one of the guys that worked on Merp back in the day for... Oh, sweet. Yeah, he did a lot of the, the cartography uh, for Middle Earth. Uh, when they were de- defining it through the through the role playing game, surprisingly, it, it's it always shocks me to, to find out like how much we know about pop culture comes from role playing games, and you know like almost everything we know about Star Trek, or sorry, Star Trek Klingons specifically, almost everything we know about uh, Star Wars in general comes from the, uh, the role playing game, and you know M- Middle Earth role play, believe it or not, ha- actually defined quite a bit of the Middle Earth world. So. Yeah, my understanding is they did a lot of interesting stuff. They they went out into a lot of areas that hadn't been touched upon. They like right. did Far Harad and a lot of these other things. Our, ours is kind of interesting. We are held by our agreement with the Tolkien Estate and Sophisticated Games. We can only refer to things in the appendices, in the Lord of the Rings, and in the Hobbit. But bless the good professor – he referenced a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a bit, lot of room there to play around. In yeah, so thing. we play in that wiggle room frequently, right. and the appendices have lots of mentions that are most useful. <laughs> well, on behalf of Daryl and myself, I want to extend our gratitude to T.S. Lukert for joining us on the show tonight to talk about Lake Mar. Thanks very much for joining us. And yeah, it was fun. Yeah, we'd love to bring you back on sometime to talk about some of your other things that you've been involved in in the, in the, in the past and in the future. But cool. until then... Uh, until next time, we're going to do our traditional endings here. So until next time, may all your hits be crits. And that about wraps things up for the Gamers Tavern. Tune in next time for our long-awaited episode on Battletech. Be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Gamers Tavern and follow us on Twitter at Gamers Tavern PC, as in podcast, to keep up to date on everything we're doing, including our live streams. If you want to watch our live streams, you can also follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Gamers Tavern Show. And every Monday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Central Time, we play Borderlands 2 with in-character commentary from myself, Rod Swanson, and Michael Surabrook. We also host Saving Throws tutorial on Dungeons & Dragons called Proficiency Check immediately following the Twitch stream. You can also follow the new Shadowrun Actual Play Game Table Season 2 Plot Resistance on Friday starting at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. And you can find the archives of all of our live streams at youtube.com slash meet in a tavern. Until next time, the tavern is closed.
Okay, so yeah, Fritz Lieber started writing in the late 30s, by the way. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Are you sad because we still get paid the same rate he did? Um, probably, you know, adjusted for inflation, we are not even close to that, what he's getting paid. Nope. I tell people I'm quite proud that I get the exact same thing R.E. Howard got for writing Conan, and then they have to think about it for a second. Like, Wait a minute. What did, he, what did he get for writing Conan? Uh, a f- four cents a word for his original Conan stuff, five cents a word for some of the later stuff. Yeah, well, just that for inflation and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 